are going to sing page 500 and listen closely because we're going to do two, three, and four. Take time to be holy. Two, three, and four. Our point needs to be. Thank you. is page 330 and we're going to sing one four and five It. Good to see you guys here, and good to see several of you more out tonight uh, than last night. I know during the week's kind of a busy time, but and those of you who were here last night, we were really blessed by the message and just being with one another. And before we turn it over to an, for another testimony, and uh, it's going to be neat to hear Skips. I've heard you know bits and pieces of it, but it's going to be neat to, to hear him get up and share it with all of us. I'd like to just invite you to pray with me. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for the sacred Sabbath hours, and Lord, we're taking time to be holy because. We know that we have no righteousness, we have no holiness of our own, and so we desperately want to be righteous, but we know that we can't, and so through Christ we can, and we're thankful for that. And Father, 
As we meet uh, this next hour, we just pray that you'll speak to our hearts. We all want to be in the kingdom, dear God. We all get bogged down with the cares of this world. And so we pray that our thoughts can be lifted up tonight, that you'll take control, dear God, of our lives and our, our hearts, we pray. And uh, may you uh, speak to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Let everybody say amen. amen. All right, Mr. Skip. Or Keith. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. <clears throat> you know, uh, Tangela asked me if I wouldn't mind sharing a short testimony with you all, and I told her that I would. And after that, I started to think about my life a little bit. You know, I thought about, you know, what I would talk about. And it's always good to hear great conversion experiences. So I, I tried to think about, you know, what, what's something big that happened? You know, I, I think of something big, and I'll, I'll build on that. It'll be good. But I couldn't think of anything. You know, it, it's good to hear... Uh, great exciting conversion stories you know when people are in gangs you hear of murders and you hear of drug dealers and you hear of all kinds of people being converted you know to the Lord and those things are exciting everyone likes those and <clears throat> you know I started to think about that myself and you know I was like I've never been a, into drugs I've never been into alcohol I, I've never been into these things and you know I praise the Lord for that and I've noticed that and thinking about it, that it's not always big things, you know, that happen that convert us. You know, there's been a lot of small things in my life that have converted me over time. And I want to just talk about a couple of those things. So growing up, um, I was one of three children, and um, I had two other sisters. Um, I had an older sister and a younger sister. And my parents, they had uh, me and my older sister at quite a young age. So they were 18, 19, and 20. So they had a lot of growing up to do themselves as well, and uh, unfortunately they had a lot of problems, to say the least. So they were addicted to drugs and alcohol. And I grew up in those conditions and I saw those things, and I saw what drugs and alcohol can do. So I never wanted anything to do with those things. I praise the Lord for that. So, so I never was into those things, and I told myself that growing up, I said, I'm never going to get involved into these things. And, you know, I saw those things happen, and I asked myself, why? Why does that happen? At a young age, growing up, I said, why? Why does this happen? And, you know, that's something that stuck as I was growing up. So later in life, um, you know, my parents told me that they were going to get a divorce. Okay, so I was in middle school, and I come home, and they say, look, we're getting a divorce. You pick where you want to go. You go with mom or you go with dad. So at 13 years old, that's tough. That's a tough decision that you have to make. So I decided to live with my father. Uh, both of my sisters went with my mother. Um, so I said, hey, I'm going to stay with dad. I can't leave him by himself. So I decided to stay with dad, and both of them continued to have problems, my mother and father both. So seeing that separation at a young age, it was tough. And I thought in my mind, why? Why does this happen? Again, there was the drugs and, and alcohol, and I thought, why? And then the divorce. I thought, why does this happen? And I kept that in my mind. So shortly after uh, making that decision to live with my father, I ended up moving in with my grandparents. They took me in um, in middle school and on up through high school. And um, I, it was tough to make that decision, you know, to move, but I did so, and they, both my parents continued to have problems. So I lived with my grandparents, and my grandparents are very loving people. I still talk to them a lot. I talk to them probably every other day at this point. And they brought me up in the Catholic Church. They were brought up Catholic, so they were Catholic. Um, and I had gone through everything in the Catholic Church growing up. Um, they would always pick me up and take me to church on Sunday, you know, take me back home uh, until I was living with them. And I continued to go to church with them on Sundays. Um, and, and over the years, as I got in high school, I started to to question things. You know, I thought, we go to church, we've been going to church forever, and we never talk about these things after church. You know, you, you go for your hour on Sunday, and you knock it out, it's done. But, but I noticed that we never talked about the sermon, the, the little inspirational sermon that was in there between all the other robotic things, but we never talked about those things, and I asked that question in my head, why? And I knew that there was something more. So that question was in my mind about that time, and I was in high school, and I started to work with my uncle and my cousin, Joe, as most of you all know. And 
as I began to work with them, I still had these questions in my mind growing up. And I began to work with them, and I began to see things that were different. You know, they prayed before they ate. They read their Bibles. And you could see those things. You walk in, and you see the Bible on the end table. You think, wow, that's, that's a little different. And you see them praying before they eat. You think, that's odd. That's, that's odd. It's just not something that I was used to growing up. So the only thing I knew about them at that point when I started to work with them is that they had a weird religion. You know, the family talked about it, the family knew of it, and the only thing I knew was that they did not watch basketball games on Saturday. That's about it, and that it was weird, and that they ate a little weird. So I had that in the back of my mind as I started to work with them. So I started to work with my uncle more in the beginning, and I ended up working with my cousin later more, but we had a lot of good times working. You know was learning the trade and you know we joked around a lot we had a lot of time in the vehicle where you know we would kid around and you know eventually my uncle began to ask me questions that were engaging he said you know what happens you ever thought about what happens when you die and I was thinking you know I've never never had anyone ask me that I've never talked about those things so that was going on in my mind and I would answer the question I said you go to heaven And, you know, he would ask engaging questions. He'd go, you think you go to heaven right after you die? And obviously he was Seventh-day Adventist. He knew the state of the dead, but he would ask engaging questions. You know, and I would think about those, and I would say, yeah, you you go right to heaven. Where else would you go? You go to heaven or hell when you die. And he says, here, let me show you something. And he opens his Bible. And eventually I began to study with him. And my cousin Joe, we began to go through a series together. And the Lord worked on me throughout my life so that when that opportunity came, I was willing to do it. And I praise the Lord for that. So I I think we all are, you know, worked on throughout our lives, but I realize that it's not always extravagant things. Um, You know, you don't have to be a murderer or a drug dealer to be converted. (laughs) Anyone can be. Um, So I praise the Lord for that. And I just wanted to share that as a testimony. You know, the, the questions that I didn't have answers to growing up and I ask why. Why was there, there this alcohol, drug abuse? And why was there a divorce? And I didn't understand the great controversy. I didn't understand, um, you know, sin and what it causes. And, and I was willing to, you know, accept that truth when it became available. So I just wanted to share that as a testimony and also um, share it as encouragement. Um, you know, there's many people, I think, around us that are in that same position. If it hadn't been for my uncle and my cousin, you know, um, sharing the word with me, who knows where I would be. But there's many people that are ready to accept that word, just like I was at that time. And the, world, the, the Lord is working on those people now, and I think we're responsible for sharing that with them. So, Amen. Good evening, everybody. It's a blessing to be here tonight. Have a long week. Um, Finally, it's Sabbath. Finally, it's Sabbath. Amen, right? Our brother Clarence, he's not here tonight, and he's leading us on prayer. Pastor asked me, you can do this. Uh, It's good good to, to pray to God. You know, when we Look in the Bible, look in the spirit of prophecy, we see how many times God is willing to talk with us. And it's every single occasion, you know, God wants to talk with us, and we look like we are not willing to do that. We have something more important that talk with God. Um, but he insists, he insists, he insists, he insists. And the way we can open our heart and communicate with him. Come to my mind tonight the prayer of Daniel. Do you remember his prayer? And uh, we found part of his prayer here. He said, listen to us. Daniel prayed to God saying, Oh God, look at us and see the trouble we are in. We are praying to you because you are merciful, not because we, had, we have done right. Lord, hear us. Lord, forgive us. Lord, listen to us and act in order that everyone will know that you are God. Do not delay. This city and these people are yours. I mean, let this prayer be our prayer tonight. And we have a promise from Lord for the Lord. It's in Matthew chapter 18. You can look in the Bible if you want. Matthew chapter 18, verse 19 and 20. 
This is the problem that we have tonight. And we will do this in, in this way. You know, God said to us tonight again, I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. Amen. That's the promise that I invite you to keep in mind tonight. I will ask you to, to choose one of your friend here, brother, sister, and let's pray together in a group of three, two or three, and we will do uh, this prayer in, in this way tonight. Amen. I was waiting for an introduction. <laughs> Happy Sabbath. It's, uh, it's good to be able to start the Sabbath with all of my family instead of waiting in the morning and say Happy Sabbath. So it's kind of weird saying Happy Sabbath at nighttime. So <laughs> enjoy the song.
You brought me this far, so why would I question you now? You have provided, so why would I start to doubt? I've never been stranded, abandoned, or left here to fight alone. So I'm giving you control. I live my life, live my life up. I give it all and surrender. I live my heart, live my heart up. You can have it forever. All my dreams, all my plans, Lord, I leave it in your hands. I live my life, live my life up. Have your way with me. Have your way with me. If this is a river, then let it sweep over me. I'm under fire, I know it's refining me I hear you calling out, I'll follow now Wherever the road may go, I know you're leading me home Take my life and let it be I give it all and surrender I lift my heart, lift my heart up Take my life I lift my life, lift my life up I give it all and surrender I lift my heart, lift my heart up You can have it forever All my dreams, all my plans Lord, I leave it in your hands I lift my life Thank you, ladies. That was beautiful. Boy, thank you. Well, good evening, everybody. Glad to see you all out here tonight. Just a friendly reminder, what we talked about last night, or made an announcement. So tomorrow night, there isn't any meeting. Um, Saturday night, have the night off. And then Sunday night, we're going to do two meetings, 4.30 to 5.30, and then there's going to be a supper uh, in between there, and then 7 to 8 is going to be the last meeting, okay? So I had to cancel, for those of you who weren't here, uh, having a little party over in Madison that uh, I just found out about this week. Okay, so today we're going to continue with John the Baptist, and we're going to look at John the Baptist's lifestyle. So Joe laid the uh, groundwork last night. He prepared the way, so to speak, for us to go into some of these things. And as you can see, the title is Secure in Simplicity. Now, I want to warn you that tonight a little bit, but Sunday night in particular, I'm going to talk about some really um, things that might be offensive to some, okay? But uh, when you come to a revival series, you should expect to be challenged, right? And so tonight we're going to talk a little bit about it, but uh, Sunday night in particular, we're going to get into some, some, some rough things, but some real solid Adventist things that have been forgotten and overlooked. So tonight, secure in simplicity. Now, before I have prayer, I just want to do a little uh, uh, highlights from what I took from last night's message. So after, I talk, after this, if I talk to Joe, he, if he says, you totally missed the point, let's see how good I did, okay? Joe just sitting there. Okay, number one. We are John the Baptist generation. Okay, John was a real guy who was called to prepare the way for the Christ's first coming, and we are also called to prepare the way for Christ's second coming. Now, a scripture that he didn't use, actually, I was holding out. I had to go to the bathroom so bad, so I did step out. I didn't see him use this scripture. Did you use Malachi 4, verse 5 of all last night? Okay, this is kind of the key verse, and I want you to look it up with me. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5, it's right before Matthew, but most of you know this already. This is the key verse that really uh, speaks to 
not only John the Baptist's ministry of the Elijah connection, but also our connection with it all too. So the Old Testament ends with this. All right, and of course the Jews were confused in Jesus' day. And still in Christianity today, they, people believe that the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11, one of them is actually going to be Elijah coming back. But here it is, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. It says this, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, you remember the question that the disciples came to Jesus and asked? They said, why is it that they say Elijah must come? And then what did Jesus say to them? You remember what Jesus said to them? Elijah's already come, and who is he talking about? John the Baptist. And so they were kind of confused in that, and so Jesus was basically saying is that the Elijah message, the Elijah message of spirit, the spirit of revival and transformation and the preaching of repentance, that has already come through the ministry of John the Baptist. But if you go back to this verse, it says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now what is that talking about, the great and dreadful day of the Lord? The second coming. So Jesus was applying this partially to John, but what primarily is this text referring to? Who is it referring to? Those who, who are living when? At the end of time, right? Us. So we are to have the Elijah message, just like John the Baptist did. Okay, number two, Joe, I think I was right on that one. Number two, amazing parallels between the message John was asked to give and to our three angels. That's what we talked about last night. Joe went through, I think it was Matthew chapter 3, and, and then he compared that with the three angels' message. And I didn't know that. I learned a lot of good information. Number three, John's op opposition was symbolic of ours. You remember he had Herod, he had Herodias and her daughter. And Joe took us to Revelation chapter 17 and showed our opposition with that, right? And then lastly, <clears throat> where he, Joe laid the found, uh, foundation for tonight, he ended by talking about, John, or he didn't end by this, but John's message leads to a lifestyle change. John's public ministry wasn't very long, and yet we know more about his lifestyle than most of the other major characters in the Bible. So did you catch that? So these things about John's lifestyle are given to us for a specific purpose, okay? Now, Joe, how did I do? Is that pretty good? Summary? All right, okay. Now, he didn't share this quote. He had it, but he, uh, he missed it last night, so I asked him to send it to me because I thought it was good. John the Baptist went forth in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of the Lord and to turn the people to the wisdom uh, of the just. He was a representative, okay, see that right there, of those living in the what days, everybody? The last days, you and I, to whom God has entrusted sacred truths to present before the people to prepare the way of the second appearing of Christ. Now notice this right here. And the same principles of temperance which John practiced should be observed by those who, are in, uh, who in our day are to warn the world of the coming of the Son of Man. So the reason why God asked Matthew and asked these other Bible writers to write down these little details of John's lifestyle was for you and I, so that we could learn from his lifestyle and, all, and apply these things to our lives as we uh, prepare, the, uh, prepare the, the way of the Lord, okay? All right, now let me share this, because I'm going to share some, um, some things that might disturb you a little bit tonight, and, but I want to start off on, a, on a, <clears throat> a gracious note. You remember the angel told Zacharias, he said, uh, you're going to call him John, and so Zacharias then, he doubted, and so he couldn't speak, right? And then when it came time to name the boy, people were thinking, well, shouldn't you name him Zacharias Jr. or something like that? And then Zacharias asked for a tablet or something, and what did he say? What did he write down? His name shall be what? John. Now, so God picked this name for John. So when God picks a name for somebody, you know it's something special. Does anybody know what the name John means? There's not any Johns in here, is there, in this church? Is there a John in this church? Is there a Jacob? Jingleheimer? No, I was thinking about that. Okay. But anyways, his name shall be John. John means Yahweh is gracious. Now notice this right here. So the New Testament begins with John, and it ends, what's the last book of the Bible? Okay, Revelation. Who wrote that? John. So it begins with Yahweh is gracious, and it ends with Yahweh is gracious. Now, by the way, the book of Revelation also, one of the scholars at Andrews, he wrote a book on Revelation, and he was sharing with us that the book of Revelation, if you read chapter 1 there, you have the introductory remarks, the revelation of Jesus Christ. But when John actually begins the letter, he begins it with grace be unto you. That's how he starts it. Then if you fast forward, so that's one bookend here at the beginning of the book of Revelation. You fast forward it down to the Revelation chapter 22 and you come to the last verse, and how does it end? Grace. 
Grace be to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. So even the book of Revelation bookends with grace. The New Testament seems to do that also. So even though we're going to talk about some tough things tonight, remember, Yahweh is gracious, and he never brings these things in to us to get us upset. It's to educate us and to teach us, right? And that's what John was trying to do also. Okay, so here's what we're going to look at tonight. John's lifestyle. Number one, the power of simplicity. Number two, we're going to look at John, a strange fellow, like Keith uh, thought Joe and uh, Don were strange fellows. People thought John was a strange fellow also. Number three, uh, diet in your walk with the Lord. And number four is the spirit and power of Elijah. So let's pray together and then we'll begin. Our Father in heaven, uh, as we talk about some of these issues tonight, you know that you've entrusted men to present them and to preach them and women. And Lord, you know that none of us are worthy to do that. It's almost embarrassing to get up here and talk about these things because we see how unworthy we are and how bad we struggle. But Father, we just pray that you'll speak to us and that um, I will be hid and things that I say will be hid and that you, your Holy Spirit will just take full control and speak to all of us individually. We pray in Jesus' name. Let everybody say, Amen. Okay, let's start off by talking about the power of simplicity. Now, notice this verse right here. I did a little study on simplicity in my little Bible search engine I have in my computer. And this verse popped up, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. Paul writing, but I fear lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Now he's going to tell us how he deceived her by his craftiness. It goes on. So your minds may be corrupted from the, what's that next word there, everybody? Simplicity that is in Christ. So what is he saying here? Eve, God gave her kind of this simple role, yet it was to be a happy role. Tend the garden, be a good wife, all these different type of things, bear children, raise children. But then she wandered one day and Satan got her thinking, look, that's a boring life. And that life, uh, I can take you to a different level, right? And so she lost the simplicity of what God had given to her. And Paul said, he's warning us not to lose that simplicity, that simplicity that is in Christ Jesus. Now notice what Mrs. White says here in book Ministry of Healing. Last year, my family read through the Ministry of Healing. You know, I like to rank things. Um, and I would rank the Ministry of Healing one of her top ten books. If you've never read the Ministry of Healing, it is such a phenomenal book. You know, the Conflict of the Ages series, those are, you know, first five. And then you have Steps to Christ and all those other great books. But Ministry of Healing is definitely top ten in my mind. But notice what she writes here. Men and women have hardly begun to understand the true object of life. They are attracted by glitter and show, okay? Attracted by glitter and show. Things. They are ambitious for worldly preeminence. Now notice what she says here. Life's best things are simplicity, honesty, truthfulness, purity, integrity. These cannot be bought or sold. They are as free to the ignorant as to the educated, to the humble laborer as to the honored statesman. Let me push pause there for a second. I might have told you this. I, um, you know, when I was in college, I you know, worked for one of these work temp agencies, you know, just trying to get little jobs here. And one day I had to babysit mentally challenged people. And some of them were somewhat mentally challenged, and others were severely mentally challenged. This one boy, I remember he was so bad, he sat at a computer screen all day, all day long, the whole eight hours I was there, and I couldn't believe it. He just clicked this little thing, and this little rabbit on the screen ran over here, and then it ran over there. And then he just did that all day long. I just couldn't believe it. Well, anyways, there was this young lady, he wasn't quite as uh, bad, and she was just telling me, I wasn't a Christian at the time, but she was telling me about Jesus. And as she did, I mean, she was so sweet and so kind. And when I was reading this verse this afternoon, or reading this passage this afternoon, I thought about her. Okay, she didn't have much education, but she had that simplicity, that simple life. Okay, for everyone, God has provided pleasure that may be enjoyed by rich and poor alike. The pleasure found in cultivating pureness of thought and unselfishness of action. The pleasure that comes from speaking sympathizing words and doing kindly deeds. So we can all have this uh, through Christ, all right? Okay, let's go on here. Notice what Psalm 116, uh, verse 6 says. The Lord preserves the who, everybody? The simple. I was brought low and he saved me. Now, Ellen White, when she was called to minister... She was, as you know the story, she was very nervous. She, you know, she didn't think she was a charismatic personality. She thought she was a boring person. She was the type of person who just kind of wanted to be behind the scenes in the corner, right? Wasn't a dynamic speaker, wasn't a striking woman by any uh, means. And so she did not want to do it. And so some, I don't know if it was an angel or the Lord himself, said this to her in a dream. Your success is in your what, everybody? Your simplicity. 
as soon as you depart from this and fashion your testimony to meet the minds of any, your power is gone. Almost everything in this age is glossed and unreal. And so God told her, look, I know you're simple. I know you're uh, you know, not the not most charismatic person, but that's the whole reason why I chose you. And her ministry was powerful, right? And she had peace after that. So there's power in simplicity. Now, I want you to notice about John. Notice what Matthew 11, verse 7 and 8 says. Turn there with me. And what I want you to notice is I think what Christ is saying here is you went out not to see a good-looking guy, a guy who had a lot of money, a guy who had nice clothes. You went out to hear a powerful message from a very simple person, right? Matthew 11, verse 7 and 8. And as they departed, Jesus began to say unto the multitudes concerning John, What went ye out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft clothing are in king's houses. And then he goes on to talk about how John was the greatest of the prophets, right? But what he's basically saying here is the simplicity of John, the simplicity of his message. And that's the point. There's power in that simple life, okay? Now, John's simple life, he had a powerful, powerful, simple message and delivery. Now, by the way, on Sunday night, what we're going to look at, we're going to look at dress, right? And we're going to talk about what we know about dress and how important that is. And that's probably going to be the part where people are going to, you know, not like me for a little while. But uh, this part also, where Mrs. White talks about the message, the delivery, and the things that have crept into Sunday-keeping churches, she writes, we're going to see these statements because they've lost the simple experience with Jesus Christ, and so they had to manufacture all this stuff. And it's even pervaded into Adventism. But John had a very simple message, and it was powerful because of his simple experience with Christ, right? Number two, as I said, we're going to talk, uh, Sunday night, we're going to talk about his simplicity in dress and what uh, we've been given uh, as reformers. We're called, we're called to be dress reformers as Adventists. Number three is he lived in a simple life, he lived a simple life in a secluded area, all right? And then lastly, uh, in these two, this one we're going to look at tonight, his, he had a simple diet, okay? All right, now let me just share with you a little uh, uh, illustration, I'm going to move off this point. I'll take a deep breath in. I've been, you guys, gonna look, you're looking at me funny, okay? So uh, here's a picture, I've showed this to you many times, I'm not going to tell you all, you know, 10 stories I've told you before, but I'll tell you a new one tonight. See, there's the church I grew up in, just a great, beautiful cathedral. You can see the marble here. They had the Stations of the Cross, and they were sculpted out in actual, actual marble figures. Uh, the town, you can't see it too well, but my town is painted right up in there. It's just beautiful. And I told you that as a boy, I just look around. It was fantastic to look at. Now, here's the church where I really became an Adventist in, about 11 miles from there. And you can see it's not as nice. Here's the inside. Is there a contrast, do you think, with the two at all? But I'll tell you what, when I walked into this church and I met those people and uh, heard them and heard the message, it was like a breath of fresh air to me. But I, my sister... Uh, she brought her boyfriend. We were doing an evangelistic series, and he came into that church, and, uh, you know, he sat through it. We were watching Mark Finley uh, on a net series, and, you know, powerful preaching, new stuff, I'm sure, to him and to her. And the next day I asked her, how did he like it? And she said this. He goes, he walked in there, and he looked around, and he said, well, this is boring. I don't feel the presence of God here at all. But that's how people think. You know, they have to have flashy, showy things up in front of them. But what God has called you and I is to keep our life simple and the message simple. Can you say amen to that, everybody? All right. Okay, so that's number one, the power of simplicity. Number two is John was a strange fellow. Now, notice what Luke chapter 7, verse 33 says. Luke 7, verse 33. So here is the rumor going around about John. Now remember, the Jews were very strict, many of them, and they were used to strict people. Some of them fast twice a week. But John, notice what they said about him. Luke chapter 7, verse 33. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread or drinking wine, and you say he has a devil. So even these Jews who were strict in their own right thought John was weird and too strict in his life, okay? And uh, that's what they, you know, they portrayed him as, as somebody who was a strange fanatic. Now, Mrs. White, the Bible tells us this, but Mrs. White, I'd, skip, I'd pull up the Bible verse for sake of time, but she tells us very clearly that uh, he was dedicated to God as a Nazarite from his birth. This was a very special vow that most often people would take just for a very short period of time. But what John decided to do is he decided to 
live his entire life as a Nazarite. Now, this is very strict because highly stimulating foods and overeating and different things like that were forbidden in this Nazarite vow. And so the word Nazarite means, a Hebrew word, it means devoted to God, completely devoted to God. So now remember what Mrs. White says, right? She says that John was to prepare the Lord, and he was a representation of those who lived at the end of time. And so you and I, where I'm going with this, are to have a very simple life, all right? Okay, here's another quotation, very similar to the one that uh, Joe had last night. John separated himself from his friends and from the luxuries of life, dwelling alone in the wilderness and subsisting upon a purely vegetable diet. What would we call him today, then, if he did that? Yeah, yeah vegan, right? Okay, it goes on. His diet also of locusts and wild honey was a rebuke to the gluttony that everywhere prevailed. And the same principles of temperance which John practiced should be observed by those who in our day are to warn the world of the coming of the Son of Man. Now, who would that last part be there, everybody? Okay, us, right? So we are to emulate John in our diet. Very clear there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about diet and our walk with the Lord. Now, I got a picture of an angel there, and the reason why I did is because you know, you guys have seen me eat before, and you probably thought he has no business talking about diet the way he eats, how much he eats. Well, I'm working on that. You can see I've lost a little weight, right, and, uh, and all that, and tried to cut out the fat. But, you know, you think, why didn't the Lord let angels do this? And uh, talking about diet, I feel so inadequate to talk about it. Somebody who's lost his gallbladder before he's age 40, you know. Uh, but, you know, the Lord uh, uses the foolishness of, of people and foolishness of preaching. So it's like, you understand what I'm trying to say here? So what I'm trying to say is I'm not better than anybody. I've got my struggles, you've got your struggles, okay? But I want to present some information that I really do believe Adventists need to practice in their lives, okay? Let's go on here. First of all, Matthew, let's go to Matthew chapter 3, verse 4. Joe spent some time on this last night, but I want you to notice that, like he mentioned, John the Baptist, he only had about, I don't know, about a year and a half, half worth of public ministry, okay? And yet we know so much about his lifestyle. Matthew chapter 3, verse 4 says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leather girdle about his loins, and his meat, or his food, was locusts and wild honey. So it specifically mentions his diet there. Now, let me tell you that there, John's diet, there's a, ra there's, a ba uh, there's a big controversy in the Christian world over his diet. Evangelicals, many evangelical scholars, they feel like John ate grasshoppers, okay? And, uh, and I, I'll just tell you my theory on this, this, because I think the evidence is so clear that John was a vegetarian, my, it's a conspiracy almost in my mind because they know that when you say that John was a pure vegetarian, that is a very strong statement that God wants us to be vegetarians too. And that's why I think they're ignoring all this clear evidence that John was in fact a vegetarian. Well, let me share you some of the evidence. First of all, it's like a 50-50 thing if you just go strictly by the word of God. That locust can mean carrot pod, but it can also mean grasshoppers, right? It could also possibly mean some sort of fish. But we believe it means the carrot pod tree. Now, for a couple of reasons, well, uh, uh, just biblically speaking, first of all, <clears throat> you know, there's a carob tr a pod tree over in the Middle East that's called St. John the Baptist tree. It's still called that. It generation after generations has called it St. John the Baptist tree, right? And uh, it's made out, you know, you can pull carob pods off of that. Also, can you picture John walking around grabbing grasshoppers and putting them in his mouth and going, <laughs> can you just picture him doing that? I just really can't. Anybody picture him doing that? And thirdly, think about it. Grasshoppers are seasonal, right? And so John would have starved to death if he just ate grasshoppers during certain parts of the year. So biblically speaking, um, it's, it seems to me that this could definitely strongly be carob pot. Number two is, Mrs. White clearly tells us that John had a purely vegetable diet. So for Adventists, that kind of settles the issue. But thirdly, back to the, from the Christian perspective, many early church fathers tell us that John did not eat grasshoppers. They were very adamant about that. Many of them were Greek scholars who knew the Greek just like it is here, and they tell us John did not eat grasshoppers, he ate the carob pod thing. And many of the early church fathers were also vegetarians, okay? Anyways, I thought you might find that interesting. So the text 
text there in Matthew chapter four, 3, verse 4 is trying to tell us that John ate a simple wilderness vegetarian diet. In other words, he didn't eat a diet that city folks were used to, meat, spicy foods, etc. Is God trying to tell us something here? What do you think in Matthew chapter 3, verse 4? Think God's trying to tell us something here? Yes, I do too. All right, so let's talk about this. Now, first of all, I want to set up a stake post here. And I always like to do that in my sermon because I don't want to be, you know, people to run off. And I try really in my own life not to be judgmental because I have my own struggles. But I want to set up a stake post here and share with you some little uh, thoughts from the Spirit of Prophecy before we go into this. First of all, we are not to be judgmental and make ourselves a criterion. And that is what people do. You know, if they get a victory in something, uh, they almost become haughty in it. And they look down on people who don't uh, have a victory in a certain area, right? And uh, we're also told we do not mark out any precise line to be followed in diet. Okay, we all have different digestive systems. And uh, I have a friend, he just cannot eat bell peppers. He'll be just sit, we'll be sitting there eating. If he eats a bell pepper, he has to run to the bathroom almost immediately, right? And so we all have different digestive systems, and we kind of work within that uh, ourselves. Okay, and number three is, Mrs. White tells us that diet reform should be, what's that next word, everybody? Progressive. What does that mean? Okay, so it takes time, right? It takes time and years and years and years. Ellen White herself took her many years to overcome and to discard th certain things in her life. And so we need to be patient um, with each other in the area of diet, right? And not make it a test of fellowship as we're going to read here in just a moment. Okay, so John had a simple diet, and here is one of the main reasons why. The SD Bible Commentary says this, it was essential for understanding truth and presenting it. So you see that right there, everybody? That is the primary reason for a healthy diet, to understand when you sit down and read the Bible. Like one man told me who was on a, some sort of a fast, he said, man, when I sit down and read the Bible, it just comes alive to me. So reading the Bible and also to present it, because that's what we want to do. We want to be John the Baptist and prepare the way for the Lord, but we're so bogged down with things in our system that our minds are not clear, then how can we give the clear three angels messages? You see what I'm saying, everybody? Hey, shake your head yes if you're still awake. Okay, all right, go. Let's go on. Okay, notice what Mrs. White says here. You need clear, energetic minds in order to appreciate the exalted character of the truth, to value the atonement, and to place the right estimate upon your eternal things. See what's happening there? We have to have that in our minds, clear minds to do that. If you pursue a wrong course and indulge in wrong habits of eating and thereby weaken the intellectual powers, you will not place the high estimate upon salvation and eternal life and conforming to God's will. See, God's will even becomes muddy to you when you have so much stuff in your system that you can't think clearly. You know how I know that? From personal experience, right? From personal experience. Now, by the way, because just a paragraph below this, see, I read uh, Councils and Diets and Food recently, before I, most of it before I had my gallbladder taken out. And um, right just below that paragraph, there's a statement on overeating. And I wrote down on there, this is like, you know, two months ago, I wrote a little note, and I just saw it today. It said, me, unfortunately. That's the little note I wrote to myself, me, unfortunately. And then a little arrow pointing at that, right? So uh, we all have our, our, our challenges. Okay, let's go on here. Council on Diet Foods, page 48, says this. The use of unnatural stimulants is destructive to health and has a benumbing influence upon the brain. Now, I'm going to show you what she lists as unnatural stimulants. And when she talks about unnatural stimulants, she puts them in two categories, which I'm going to explain here in just a moment. Okay? But so, using unnatural stim stimulants is destructive to health and benumbing influence upon the brain. Making it, what's that next word, everybody? Okay, everybody fell asleep because they're benumbed by unnatural stimulants, so I'm just kidding. It's impossible to appreciate internal thi eternal things when we are so, uh, our minds are so benumbed by these things. Those who cherish these idols cannot rightly, rightly value the salvation which Christ has wrought out for them by a life of self-denial. Do you, so you see that, everybody? Okay, so here are some of the unnatural stimulants that she lists, and they're in two categories. The category number one is right here. She calls these sinful. Uh, things. And that's why Adventists are health reformers. We really want to get people off these things right away. Okay, liquor, tobacco, coffee, and what's that next one right there, everybody? Tea. Okay, she's really strong on tea. Now, I don't mean the nice herbal teas, the teas that have caffeinated things in them. 
God does not want us to do that. She calls them unnatural stimulants, and she even in another place calls them sin. And so we want to take those things out of our lives, okay? All right, now these, she put, these next ones she puts in a different category. They're still unnatural stimulants that hurt your mind, but they're not on the same level as these. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Because I don't want to become clear to think if you're, you, you're a part of this next one that you are like a, a wicked person or something. Okay, she talks about spices, all right? I struggle with that. Still, I'm, I'm really uh, working uh, now to get, uh, try, try not to eat too much spicy food. She also talks about meat being an unnatural stimulant that affects your mind in a bad way. She also talks about animal products in various forms also, right? So those are unnatural stimulants that, we, that affect the way that we view things, and they certainly do, okay? So you want a clear mind. Not, let me, let me share with you some thoughts. And uh, these are, you, know, you can find them clearly in her writings. Uh, for a clear mind, not eating in between meals, snacking at eating at regular times, now, she's very strong on this because of how it affects your organs and how it affects your minds. And, like, I, I'm surprised that many Adventists don't know this, not saying that I'm perfect because I just got my gallbladder taken out. Remember that? Remember I said that already? And um, I got a picture of it. And, and, and Marcella, I think, or Roman took it of me. I don't remember who it was. I was kind of drugged up, but one of them took it of me. I'll show it to you in just a minute. Okay. <clears throat> Anyways, we're talking about eating between meals, right? And... Um, I had one elder tell me one time, he goes, I just eat once a day, and he's got a big joke, and he's got a big belly, too, actually, but he, um, he said, I eat in between, he said, I said, uh, he says, I eat one meal per day, and he says, uh, just when I get up, I eat all day long until I go to bed, right? And this is so hard on our bodies, because we're told that, you know, that there should be five-hour gap in between the time that we eat. So we, we eat in the mornings, okay, our, that we put that food into our system, your body naturally it works in a way to digest that food. But if you eat at 7 o'clock, and then you eat again at 10 o'clock, you, you put that food back into your system, your body has to start all over again. And it's so hard on your organs, right? And so we need to, she says that we need to have about five hours in between, a gap in between our meals, right? Okay, now let me tell you, this is, oh, boy, I'm running out of time. I've got to skip. I can't tell you as many stories as I want to. Okay, eating late at night is something else that is very strongly uh, talked about in the spirit of prophecy. We eat food late at night, 9 o'clock, even 8 o'clock, 8.30, 10 o'clock, and we put all this food into our system, then we go to bed. You know what that does for you? It, uh, your body, your whole body needs rest, including your digestive system. But when you do that, your body... Your brain is sleeping, not as well, but your organs are not uh, resting the way that they should. Now, a friend of mine who's really into health, he told me this. He said, people who eat late at night, or, Alzheimer's has been linked to eating, eating and then falling asleep. Okay, did you hear that? Now, I don't want Alzheimer's at all. And uh, so that scared me when he told me that. So, but uh, he said that that's true. All right, so let's go on here. So we, it's essential for understanding truth and presenting it. Number two. <clears throat> Why do we want a simple diet? Because we want to have cl as close to the diet of heaven as possible. We're getting ready to occupy heaven, right? And we want to have a close diet. Now, I won't look at this up for sake of time, but Philippians chapter 3 talks about our bodies being changed. We get new bodies, but our characters are developed down here by the grace of God, right? So in other words, our likes and our dislikes uh, stay pretty, not completely the same because our sinful propensities will be gone, but our li our basically our likes and our dislikes are going to be translated just to heaven. We get new bodies. A lot of people get the idea that just all of a sudden we're going to just have completely different likes and dislikes when we go to heaven. No, that's why we are to overcome down here. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? Okay, let me share with you a story to try to, to illustrate the point. I won't tell you the person's name. Um, he's not a member of my church, but um, <clears throat> he was over at our house one time, and he was talking about how much he loves coffee. And he was talking about this coffee that you pay like $1,000 for a cup of it. He'd never had it. But he talked about cof cups of coffee that you pay $100 for and all this stuff. And here's what he said. He goes, I just can't live with the he drinks these energy drinks, all this coffee. And he just said, I can't live without it. I can't live without it. And I didn't say it to him because I didn't know him well enough. But you know what I thought in my mind? I thought, this is not going to be in heaven. And if you can't live without it here then what choice does God have? Because he's not going to allow these things to rise up again a second time. So what am I trying to say? By the grace of God, we need to, you know, overcome these things in our lives today. All right, so let's talk about this one right here. Meat eating, okay? And let me just read you some statements here. 
The question whether we shall eat butter, meat, or cheese is, and this is, here's a balance here. The question whether we shall eat butter, meat, or cheese is not to be presented to anyone as a, what's that next word, everybody? A test. So that's what we don't do. There's actually, I think it's the Reformed um, Church, of uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. They, um, they, they do have as a test, I believe. I could be wrong on that, but they do have as a test. that You have to become a vegetarian before you can get baptized. We're told very clearly that it's not a test. It's a progressive thing. We all grow and learn, right? We all have, you know, from our upbringing, uh, it, sometimes it takes a while longer to overcome these things. But we're not to be presented as a test. <clears throat> but we are to educate and to show the evils of the things that are objectionable. Then she puts the different category here, tea, coffee, tobacco, and alcohol, we must present as sinful indulgences. We cannot place the same ground, meat, eggs, butter, cheese, and such articles placed upon the table. So there's the two different categories there. So we do, we ask people to give up tobacco, we ask them to give up liquor, we ask them to give these things before they're baptized. But these other things are in different category that we try to educate people on, okay? All right, let's go on here. Here's what she says. Again and again... I have been shown that God is trying to lead us back step by step to his original design, that man should subsist upon the natural products of the earth. Vegetables, fruits, and grains should compose our diet. Not an ounce of flesh meat. Now, how much is an ounce? This is like a little burger at Burger King or whatever. Not one ounce. So, uh, should go into our stomachs. The eating of flesh is unnatural. We are to return to God's original purpose in the creation of man. Is it not time that all should aim to dispense with flesh foods? How can those who are seeking to become pure, refined, and holy, that they may have the companionship of heavenly angels, continue to use as food anything that has so harmful an effect on the soul and the body? How can they take the life of God's creatures that they may consume the flesh as a luxury? See what she's asking there? We've got to get rid of it. We want to be in heaven. We've got to, um, and if we like these things so much, now there are extreme circumstances where you do, it's okay to eat meat, right? Extreme circumstances, right? You're out in the, the woods or whatever, and uh, you need to, you're starving or, or whatever. But really in the United States and Canada, there is really no excuse for Adventists to eat meat. And that's what she's trying to say. How can you kill an animal for your own purposes just because you like the taste of that, all right? Now, here's a very strong statement. Councils and Diet and Foods, page 380. Among those who are waiting for the coming of the Lord, meat eating will eventually be done away. Flesh will cease to be, uh, uh, be a form, a part of their diet. We should ever keep this end in view and endeavor to work steadily toward it, okay? So those who are going to be translated amongst God people will eventually give meat eating up in their own lives, and their own diets, all right? Okay, so the Adventist Health Study 2, you know, that recent one that was done about 10 years ago, I took it myself. I was just made the cut right around 30 was the age, and uh, I was shocked when I read the results. Okay, now worldwide, I could see the res results because in certain places, you know, where they don't have access to as much as we do here, fruits and vegetables, you know, meat eating is, you have to do it, right? But in the United States and Canada, I was so, I was sad when I read this. 46% of Adventists are not vegetarians in the United States and Canada, okay? When we're to spell this out so clearly. Now you're thinking, what strange doctrine are you preaching? This is nothing new. You think, they don't teach us at the seminary, do they? Yes, they do. The professors, some of them are very hard in the classroom encouraging the ministers to give up the meat eating because it's so clear. She says that ministers who eat meat cannot be trusted by the people. Now that's a strong statement, right? Okay. I'm almost done. 30, now, by the way, that's something very interesting for those of you who are uh, mostly ve are vegans. There was 30 pounds difference between vegetarians and vegans. That was another interesting thing from the study. Okay, almost done here. Okay, last, uh, third one here. We want to have product, we want to productively serve God as long as possible. That's why we want a simple diet, right? You know that this is a statement, you've read this one before, Exodus 15, verse 26. God speaking, if you diligently heed the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight, give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you which I put abroad on the Egyptians. And I've showed you these slides, you've seen them in other places. What were the things that the Egyptians were dying of? Okay, here they are right here. This doctor did a bunch of study on these mummies. Heart disease, cancer, arthritis, obesity, high blood pressure, rheumatism, uh, STDs. What, is, uh, what does that remind you of? Anything that reminds you of today, right? Because of their high fat, high stimulating diet that they were eating there. Now, something that I didn't know was Hepshetsut. And who, how do we know Hepshetsut? Anybody uh, know Hepshetsut from anywhere? Who was she? That, who do we think she was? The mother of who? The Egyptian mother of Moses, right? And uh, Dr. Hazel, when we were at the GYC, he shared with us, 
And she was overweight, and I, I researched it myself. He's right, even though he's an expert in Egyptian archaeology. I just wanted to check on it. She was overweight, had diabetes, had arthritis, bad teeth, and she died of bone cancer in her 50s. And I thought about this in my imagination. Moses knew her. I know he loved this woman, and I'm sure he encouraged her to get off that diet, but she probably didn't listen to him. She died in her 50s. How, long, how old was Moses when he died? Yeah, can you, there's a major difference there from the diet that the world was promoting and the diet that God's people were asked to do there, right? So we want to live long. We want to live happy. Oh, here's my picture. Now, I don't remember who uh, took it, Marcella Roman there. And uh, uh, do you remember who took it? Anybody? I don't remember. But I was, I, was, I was on drugs. I was feeling no pain at that point. Believe me, it was kind of nice, actually. But um, anyways, so they took it, probably thought I'll probably use it someday. But, you know, it's really hard to serve God from the sidelines. It really is. And that really was a wake-up call for me, and I'm thankful for it. That it was, uh, I lost an organ that wasn't too, too valuable, right? And um, I hope by the grace of God that I can uh, keep progressing. It's a day-by-day -day journey that we all struggle with, but we all can't get stagnant in this thing. We've got to keep walking forward. Can you say amen with that, that everybody? All right, let me finish with an encouraging note here. The spirit and power of Elijah. I've got a Bible verse. Luke 1, verse 17. Notice what the angel said here about Luke. This is what we want. And you know where, how it comes from? A simple, trusting relationship with God and living a simple lifestyle ourselves. We're going to talk more about that Sunday night. Luke 1, verse 17. <clears throat> it says, And he shall go before him in, in the spirit of and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Beatrice shared with me a story, a sermon that she was listening to, and I wish I could have gotten more details with the guys from Australia, and uh, so I listened to part of it too. And I thought it was a beautiful story to end because the, the sermon was on contentment and simplicity, basically. And the young man was just basically sharing how content and how simple his grandfather was and how he didn't really appreciate his grandfather, who was an Adventist missionary, didn't really appreciate his stories until he almost got too, too old and too late to really appreciate him. But he shared one story that he remembered his grandfather telling him. And he was an Adventist missionary to Papua New Guinea, and uh, he was there for 20 years sharing the Adventist message there. He lost his first wife while serving there, and uh, he just continued on after a short period of time working and, uh, <clears throat> while he was over there. And he was warned to be careful of cannibals. As they traveled down these rivers, as they found these people in these villages, be very careful because some of them are cannibals. And uh, when they see a white person, which they'd never seen before, they think, I wonder what that white flesh tastes like, right? That's what he was kind of warned of. Maybe it tastes a little sweeter, or I don't know what people taste like. I've never had it before. But anyway, I don't know what they're thinking. So they warned him. Anyway, so he went to this, uh, this place, and he believed. They prayed, and they believed that God had led him to this specific place, this village. And uh, they went up, and they told the, the elders of this village that they'd like to tell them about their God. And uh, they basically said, sure, here's a place for you to stay, and tomorrow or whatever, we're gonna, we'll talk about it. Well, that night, they were woken up in the middle of the night to the he a heavy drum beat. And they were all very disturbed, you know, the, the drum beat. And so this guy, the grandpa, he got up in the middle of the night, he walked to where he heard the, you know, kind of snuck over there to where he heard the drum beating, and he got there and he saw them banging on the drum and war paint on. And he thought to himself, what is going on here? And then he saw some um, containers in a certain spot, and he walked over there, and they had banana leaves on them, and he opened them up, and guess what he saw in there? Human remains. So he knew, he put two and two together, and he realized what was going on there. Okay? They were going to eat him, potentially that night. So he goes back to the hut. He tells the other guy, wakes him up. He tells him what's going on here. And several of them want to leave. And, and uh, he says, listen, if we leave now, they are going to think that our God is so weak that it can't protect us. And so they decided to stay, and they decided to pray. And they prayed till 3 in the morning, till finally, you know, I don't know if the drum beat stopped or whatever, they finally felt uh, more peaceful, and they went to bed. Well, the next day, it was, or, the, or you know, sometime after that, the tribal leaders met with him, and they said, listen, who were all those white warriors that, warriors that you had? We came over to your hut. They were going to eat them, and we saw all these white warriors surrounding your hut. Who, where did you get those? Where did they go? You know, you know what it was, right? Angels. Well, anyways, they stuck it out there, 
and several of those people were converted to the Advent faith because of their simple faith and trust in God. A simple man, a simple life, who believed in this simple, powerful message that you and I have. And so my prayer for us is that we can all live that, have that simple walk with him. We can simplify our lives, simplify our diets, and all of us be ready when Jesus comes. Can you say amen to that, everybody? Okay, let's stand and sing our closing uh, song. Father in heaven, we know that we are weak, but you are strong. We know that we are uh, failed every single day, each step of the way. We couldn't take one step without you, dear God. And so we pray that you'll come into our hearts afresh and renewed because we do have the desire to serve you and love you. Lord, we pray that you'll help us overcome anything in our lives and walk the straight and narrow path. And we want to be used by you like John was to prepare the way for the Lord. And like those who have gone before us like this Adventist missionary, please use us and bless us to this end. We thank you for the Sabbath hours. Please give us a safe ride home and bring us back tomorrow morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everybody say amen. amen.